And today we're talking about osteoporosis and kidney disease and bone health. So Dr. Hashmi, to start us off, what is osteoporosis and what role do the kidneys play in bone health? Yeah, this is such a complicated topic today, guys. So you might have to watch this video a couple of times to fully understand the nuances. So osteoporosis, in the simplest terms we can define it, is that your bones essentially get weak. And when we say they get weak, it's both the strength and the structure of the bones that starts to get weak. And so the thing that people forget is bones are actually living tissue. They're constantly being broken down. They're constantly being replaced. And essentially what happens is osteoporosis is where the creation of new bones, it can't keep up with the loss of old bones. And this is where people start to forget things is, you know, you're born with these bones and that's all it is. No, you're constantly remodeling and rebuilding. So when we talk about things like kidney disease, what happens is that a lot of folks who have chronic kidney disease also have osteoporosis. And this is important because when you look at things like the NHANES survey, you'll find that about 27% of patients with osteoporosis also had chronic kidney disease stage three. And so the reason this matters is a lot of times people get confused over osteoporosis versus bone disease that's secondary to kidneys. So bone disease secondary to kidneys is called CKD, MBD, or mineral bone disorder. And so as your kidneys function gets worse, there are all sorts of issues come up. For example, your calcium levels, your phosphorus levels, your para, which means next to, parathyroid gland, the parathyroid hormone that it secretes gets abnormal. The ability to convert inactive vitamin D, which is what comes from the sun, to the active form gets affected. And on top of all of these things, what happens is, is that there's actually effects on bones specifically around how bones turn over. Remember, they're constantly building while they're constantly breaking down. And so this concept of CKD, MBD, is very important to differentiate from this term osteoporosis. And the reason that matters is because the treatments for both of them are entirely different. So when we talk about bones, the most common way people will look at it is essentially bone mineral density. And they'll classify osteoporosis if your bone mineral density is more than 2.5 standard deviations below that of a young adult female as a reference standard. And so if it's more than 2.5 standard deviations below, that is the definition of osteoporosis. Okay, got it. And so how is osteoporosis then typically treated? And are there any special considerations for the kidney disease population as far as that yeah. treatment goes? So this is where we have to now look at how do we define CKD, MBD versus your typical osteoporosis? So let's start <clears> with <throat> the most simplest marker, which is parathyroid hormone. Remember, para next to. So parathyroid hormone, you'll find that in CKD, MBD, in other words, kidney disease-induced bone issues, it's going to be usually elevated. Versus in osteoporosis, when you check a PTH level, it's not. So it's a simple blood test, and that can guide us. Another one is alkaline phosphatase. If you look at alkaline phosphatase in CKD, MBD, it's elevated, but in osteoporosis, it's usually normal. And then there's other things such as calcium, phosphorus, FGF23, um, 125-hydroxyvitamin D, and etc. that will be abnormal in CKD, MBD, but they will be normal or just slightly off when it comes to things like osteoporosis. So now for the treatment. So now that we know that these are two essentially different things that we're trying to treat. The first thing is what's important about treatment. So every single person should understand that lifestyle, lifestyle, and lifestyle are critical. That means you got to exercise. If you're smoking, you got to quit smoking. If you're drinking alcohol, some people say, look, there is a safe limit. My take on alcohol is there's really no safe limit, but the formal guidelines are, listen, don't drink excessive. 
My perspective is don't drink. I get it that, you know, people like alcohol, the taste and so forth, but from a ROI or return on investment, there is not a single good thing that comes out of alcohol that I know about. I could be wrong for folks, but that's essentially what the data has. So that's that. Now, the key differentiating factor in treating this is what's your kidney function like? If your kidney function is over 30 of the GFR versus less than 30, the treatment becomes very different. For example, if the GFR is greater than 30 and we're dealing with osteoporosis, then we want to make sure you get calcium and vitamin D. And that's going to be the same recommendation as the general population. So as long as we don't think this is CKD, MBD, we're going to treat you like anybody else with calcium and phosphorus. I'm sorry, with calcium and vitamin D. Now, if your kidney function is less than 30, yes, we still want calcium and vitamin D, but the total calcium intake is going to be less. And for example, we'll say that instead of uh, 1,200, we may go a little bit even less than 1,200, but generally for CKD less than 30, it's around 1,200 milligrams total intake, meaning food and everything else combined. Now, on top of these two distinctions, then we get to this concept of people who are fracturing. In other words, if you are actually diagnosed because you got a fracture and it's diagnosed as osteoporosis, the treatment differs if you're above 30 and it differs if you're less than 30. So if you're fracturing and you have a GFR less than 30, then it makes sense to give you an overall bisphosphonate. But generally, you'll hear that bisphosphonates are not recommended for GFRs less than 30. The exception to that is when we're dealing with patients who are actually showing up with a fracture, not just osteoporosis. There's other drugs. Denosumab, for example, is used because of the fact that it's not cleared by the kidneys. So it's an alternative option that people can use. So if you're less than 30 and fracturing, that's where bisphosphonates ends up being used. If you're over 30, then it's the same treatment you do for everybody else. But now what if it's CKD MBD? If it's CKD MBD, then we need to start to focus on what's happening. In other words, if you have um, a condition where your parathyroid gland is overactive, we need to slow that down. How do we do that? We will correct your vitamin D intake. So it might be the inactive form over the counter, or it might be the active form, things like calcitriol. So once again, very complex topic, but the treatment depends on, is it osteoporosis or is it bone disease due to chronic kidney disease? And if you're wondering, it is very important that you work with your endocrinologist and you work with your nephrologist so that together we can figure out what is the best treatment option for you. And a lot of people start to get concerned that you know, what happens with osteoporosis treatment? Can these drugs harm our kidneys? So this is an old story. And that's why in the past, there was a lot of concern about using these in patients with CKD4 or 5, or essentially kidney function less than 30. Newer studies don't show an impact, an adverse or harmful effect of bisphosphonate in CKD stages four and five. And that's why the recommendation I just talked about is if you present with fractures and you have osteoporosis and the kidney function is less than 30, we would use bisphosphonates. Gotcha. And that was one of the questions that someone had sent in about it was those medications specifically for osteoporosis you know, is it that like, can they impact the kidneys or kidney function? Or is it that in late later stages that they can build up because the kidneys are filtering it out? Or is it like, Hey, if I'm stage three and take this, is it going to cause damage to my kidneys and make my kidney function worse? I think that's like the fear that people have around those. <clears throat> and we have options such as denosumab, which is an alternative that is not cleared by the kidney. So you can also use that if the GFR is very low. So in both regards, you can use it. So gotcha. Michelle, then let's switch topics in terms of our, our diet side. You know, 
when it comes to diet, what's the role of diet and osteoporosis and bone health? Yeah. So, I mean, again, just like um, you had mentioned, there's differences between CKD, MBD, and osteoporosis. There is with diet as well. And there's also some overlap. Um, but overall with bone health and diet, there's certain nutrients and certain dietary patterns that are important um, and that can impact the bone health. And so, of course, specific nutrients that we'll talk more about that calcium, vitamin D, even things like vitamin K, magnesium, and then dietary patterns. Um, that's where, you know, we see things like even Mediterranean dietary like patterns are more beneficial, but also can lower frailty scores. And then there's even, we always talk about gut health um, and the gut kidney access. There's also a link between gut health and bone health. And so with an unhealthy gut, you can have um, poor absorption of different nutrients like calcium and vitamin D. And so that's where the you know, diversity of your gut bacteria and having a healthy intestinal lining and improving digestion, all of those are things that can impact, you know, bone health and, and bone density. Yeah, those, those are great points. And, and for everybody listening, remember that when we talk about diet recommendations, one of the things to keep in mind is, is an acidic diet and the more acidic foods, that means meats, the more acid you add to the body, the more buffer that gets released from the bones to neutralize that acid. So the buffer for us is bicarb and you use the bicarb that's already present in the bloodstream. As that starts to run low, we start to release stuff from our bones to be able to counteract that. So acidity for chronic time, not just a few days, a few months, but for years, does impact the overall health of our bones. And this is why when we talk about things like eating more plants or predominant plant-based diet, part of that is, is it's an alkaline type diet. So Michelle, then what about supplements for osteoporosis? And how about, you know, for folks with kidney disease and using supplements? Well, I think the most common supplement that would probably come up is calcium. And like you had already mentioned, it's, it is important with osteoporosis to ensure that someone is not having, that they are getting adequate amounts either from their diet, or it might need to be a combination of calcium supplement and the diet, but it's not, I think oftentimes with osteoporosis, it's like, Hey, you have this, here's a calcium supplement. And it's important to look at the diet, especially in someone with CKD and make sure that total, um, you know, they're, you know, around that 1,000, 1,200, they're not low, like under 600 or under 400, but that they're not, you're actually supplementing something that is, is needed. And it may very well be needed. It might not be, but you know, calcium sources from the diet, you know, animal is obviously going to be your dairy products, yogurt, cheese, or fish like sardines and salmon that have the bones. Um, and then your plant sources are things like your leafy greens, kale, bok choy, um, broccoli rab, soy products, soybeans, or tofu that's been set with calcium, and then sesame seeds, tahini, nuts, and even figs. Um, you know, some dried fruits are going to be plant sources. And a lot of people will ask then, well, okay, plant sources like leafy greens have oxalates and that can um, disrupt the calcium absorption. And so one, I mean, bok choy, kale are going to be lower in oxalate compared to spinach. So you can choose that. And then boiling the leafy greens can also lower the oxalates. Um, so that's something. The other thing is vitamin D, I think is a supplement that we regularly consider in the CKD population and osteoporosis. And so it's just having an amount um, that is, you know, you know, having your blood levels checked in an amount that is going to help increase the absorption of calcium. And we have videos on vitamin K2. And so usually we're recommending K2 with that vitamin D because um, we want that calcium to go to the bones, not to the blood vessels and arteries. Um, other things are like, mag I mentioned magnesium. So we want to make sure people are getting it in their diet, you know, seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, lentils, black beans, peas, um, edamame, like those are all sources of magnesium, but it might be something that supplementation might be needed depending on the person and, and their intake. Um, and then the other thing to just dietary, I think what comes up a lot con that people have confusion about with CKD and osteoporosis is that usually people with osteoporosis, they're recommended to consume more protein in the diet. And then we're always talking about less protein with CKD. And so 
kind of a gray area with that. But for osteoporosis, it's usually recommended to not consume less than the RDA, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein per day. And people in CKD, it's recommended to not go over 1.3 grams per kilogram. And so depending on the stage, I would say, especially, you know, if someone's stage four or five, then you might have to be a little more restricted with the protein, but especially if they're an earlier stage of kidney disease, I think you can find that sweet spot of, Hey, hit the RDA, but make sure you're not going into a realm of protein that's considered excessive for someone with kidney disease. And of course then, and you mentioned animal protein before and being more acid forming, if someone is consuming a little bit more protein because they are, um, you know, they have osteoporosis, they're concerned about that, then really emphasizing those plant proteins over the animal proteins can be beneficial in someone with both osteoporosis and chronic kidney disease. Um, and I think the only other thing from a supplement standpoint that I would say is that, um, that sometimes I've seen like in some osteo type supplements, they'll have boron. And I don't know if you know much about boron, but I think, you know, the kidneys have to filter it out. And so it's normally not a regularly recommended supplement for someone with kidney disease. Um, So I would just say that's one of those ones where if, if you're kind of taking these combination supplements for osteoporosis that have other minerals, you would really want to check that and clear that with your um, nephrologist to make sure it's not something, a mineral that you wouldn't want to be supplementing or maybe not supplementing in that dose with kidney disease. Anything to add to that, Dr. Hashmi? Oh, I think that's great. Okay. Well, that is what we have on um, CKD and osteoporosis. And again, we have lots of other videos and information on CKD, MBD. And a lot of times people present with both, right? You can have kidney disease and CKD, MBD, and osteoporosis. And so it's this whole matrix of um, figuring out. But I would say one of the most important things that people can be doing for their bone health, regardless of all that, is, is that you mentioned the exercise, the resistance training, the strength training, regardless of what supplements you're taking. If you're not doing that, um, you you know, that is what is going to be protecting your bones and your bone health the most. So there you guys have it, osteoporosis and kidney disease, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dr. Hashmi.